for taking time out of your sequestered lifestyle to join us. Um, all good faces to see. It's been a while for some of you. Um, but I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then um, David's going to take it over. And of course, um, at some point in this conversation, we'll have some Q&A and uh, try to bring it down uh, where the rubber hits the road and start talking about our real fears as they pertain to uh, the economy and um, family, the future. So, uh, Lord, thank you for this time to gather uh, through this wonderful means called technology. Um, it's beyond our understanding, but we thank you for the people that have created it for us to use, that sustain it. Uh, we pray that everything will go well, um, that we'll be able to communicate all the way to the end. And in the end, Lord, we do pray that you would be lifted up and glorified, that you would be, um, you would be the one that we worship and truly love in a dear, more precious way. Um, we're going to reveal our, our heart's desires here tonight. We're going to expose um, even some uh, things that compete against you. And so, God, we pray that you uh, give us the grace and uh, the gospel and be able to stare boldly into the cross and uh, give all and surrender all to you. And uh, we pray for health and vitality for those that are sick in our churches. We pray for their protection. We pray for their, their healing. And uh, we commit our lives to your care this evening. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, David, take it away. All right. All right. Well, I'm gonna do a little technology here. Let's see if this works. All right. Oops, let me do one more thing. All right. Okay. Um, maybe get a little bit of a thumbs up from folks. Maybe people could raise their hand to make sure they can see what I'm seeing. Can you at least see what I'm seeing, Dwayne? I can see it. The non anxious presence in our out of control world? Yes. All right, this is the best part of the entire conversation. You will not have to see my face for a little while. So this is great. Um, I, well, let me tell you a little bit about kind of my journey. Several years ago, um, I, was, uh, I, was in, I was dealing with some relational tension in, in my life and I couldn't quite figure out how to, how to unpack it. And uh, in God's grace, I stumbled upon someone who referenced Ed Friedman, that's the, Book I, you see here, um, uh, he was referencing that this book, A uh, Failure of Nerve, uh, and through the course of just a, just a one-page little document, gave a synopsis of his book that I thought was incredibly helpful, especially as it comes to relationships. It helped me start to understand the different ways that I was addressing my uh, my my anxious feelings toward people and the way that I was posturing and pretending and deflecting and and uh, in the ways that I was wanting to run from them or other in other relationships where I wanted to run at them instead of toward them and uh, it was just it kind of started to expose some of my own heart and my own idolatries and relationships and it was incredibly helpful but there's just a couple of quotes I want to reference from treat from Friedman that hopefully will kind of set the tone for some of our conversation and Dwayne, you you stop me at any time, and I'll pause and clarify or, or whatever just, uh, as we go. But just a couple of quick quotes here. The climate of contemporary America has become so chronically anxious that our society has gone into an emotional regression that is toxic to well-defined leadership. I, I think we can all feel that and agree with that. And if you have a Facebook uh, account, you can amen that. Uh, that is the definition of Facebook at times, especially in our present context, not just uh, with the coronavirus, but with politics and religion and everything else that we are experiencing significant toxicity within our relationships, what Friedman calls chronic anxiety. Um, and, and he goes on and says chronic anxiety can induce an approach to life that's counter-evolutionary. Of course, you can kind of pick up what he means there. That, that especially for me as a Christian, for us as Christians, there is an acknowledgement that uh, the, the, the life of the Christian ought to be one of transformation, of, of a kind of spiritual evolution in our lives. And chronic anxiety, Friedman suggests, is counter to that. Um, now, Friedman is not a Christian. He's a, he's a, he's a Jewish uh, man that uh, has expressed and shared a lot of wisdom or had shared a lot of wisdom. He passed several years ago. He, in fact, this book was in the middle of being written. He had 
plotted out, I think, 10 chapters and about five chapters in, um, uh, he had passed away. And it was after his death that this book was uh, polished up a little bit and put out for print. And, uh, but, but, but what he's really arguing for is a sort of systemic anxiety, that anxiety exists in every relational sphere, whether that's a married couple, and there, it could be that your, your system anxiety is very low, but it's there. It's there every time the wife asks, how do I look in this? And the husband wonders, is it safe for me to say what I really think? It's there every time you have a, uh, <laughs> my wife is shaking her head. No, it's not. It's not ever safe. Um, it, uh, it's there when you're trying to figure out how do you talk to your, your daughter about her broken heart. It's there when you're, when you're trying to talk to your son about his frustrations at work. It, it, you, you wonder, how do I engage with this with this person in front of me or this group of people, churches, office spaces, anxiety is everywhere. And you certainly see it. Friedman would say this in the, in the early going of his book. You see it at the cultural level. You see across America. Uh, and this was, again, years ago when he wrote this and surmised, uh, recognized this. It, anxiety is all over the place and comes up in pretty significant ways. But before I jump into more specifics on Friedman's view, I just wanted to talk about a couple of definitions. First one is, is this word anxiety. Uh, the, you can see Sadek, Sadek, and Ruiz uh, say it, it's a diffuse, unpleasant, vague sense of apprehension. It, anxiety is that possibility, it's that future <laughs> potential of things not going the way that I anticipate them going. It's what Jesus was talking about when he said, don't be anxious about tomorrow. It's what I think Paul was talking about when he uses, with, with, at least in our English Bibles, that uses the word, uh, be anxious for nothing. Um, but nonetheless, we are, and we do. We experience anxiety. We're experiencing it right now in the context of this, of this pandemic. We're, we're dealing with a sense of the foreboding of a possible future. And of course, within psychological and psychiatric world, that comes out in uh, pretty profoundly unhealthy ways. Well, I think that uh, that idea of anxiety is what Friedman's talking about when he uses this notion of chronic anxiety. It's kind of similar to if you have a, a knee that needs to be replaced and you slowly feel the deterioration of that knee, you feel pain in the knee, you feel discomfort in the knee, uh, and yet the, the knee's discomfort, while it's getting worse and worse, you, you're willing to manage it. You're willing to continue to take a few extra pills to try to keep dealing with an alternate op uh, option, which is rather than a chronic pain, you're, you're going to recognize that in order to really fix this thing, you need to deal with it acutely. Surgery brings with it acute pain. And, uh, and, and, and the sense of, on the one hand, you've got something that, that you're finding at least potentially tolerable. On the other, you know full well it's going to lay you up for weeks while you go through physical therapy and all kinds of other things. But so that, that idea, that's the idea of anxiety. It's that, it's that general sense of foreboding that's, uh, of things that uh, may never be, but they're always in the background. Fear, um, which I would say kind of is the underlying thing. It's, one is a potential threat, a possible threat. Fear is that immediate or definite threat, the emotional response to a known or definite threat. Uh, the danger is real, definite, and immediate. There's a clear and present object of fear. That's uh, the American Psychiatric Association. Again, I think that's probably what we feel when we're in relationships or in situations where we see the, the problem in front of us and it's, it's not just that we feel the problem in front of us, but it's right in front of us. Even in, in the context of relationships, when, when, when you have that threatening person that's in your face and, and suggesting that they're gonna uh, do violence to you in some way, there's a difference between the possible threat and truth threat. And then of course, I think that's it. That's this acute anxiety or, or fear. I think they're both playing in the same uh, sandbox, but you, you've got that little bit of a distinction that might help us as we go forward. But what I thought I'd do in order to kind of really um, bring this thing to, to, to some clarity to Friedman's ideas, especially in the context of relationship is a little video. I'm going to try to do this without too much trouble. 
Uh, okay. Dwayne, can you confirm that you can see the, the website now that or the Facebook page or the YouTube page? No, I, it went back to the, um, the screenshot. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I forgot to hit share again. Thank you for bearing with me. Here you go. Okay. That it? Yes. That it? Yep. I can see it. Let's hope y'all can hear this. A leader is someone who influences a group of individuals to accomplish a common goal, whether that goal is to design a fuel efficient car, respond to an international military crisis, or find a new company health plan. Now, there are many different ideas out there about how to become an effective leader. Some suggest that leaders must have certain traits, such as intelligence or self-confidence, sociability, maybe even being tall. Others say it's about technique or skill that leaders can acquire. But in a failure of nerve, the late Edwin Friedman goes against the grain of leadership studies and suggests that effective leadership is not about traits or skills as much as it is an emotional process of regulating one's own anxiety. He refers to this process as self-differentiation or knowing where one ends and another begins. This is a systems perspective on leadership rooted in cell biology. Take this healthy biological cell. It has a nucleus which controls the activity of the cell. It has these mitochondria floating around here and it has a cell membrane which keeps the cell separate from other cells when they hang out together to form biological tissue like this heart. This heart cell is differentiated. It knows this purpose is to pump blood. Boom, 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 boom. Despite what these uppity brain cells may think. Boom, boom, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Not only are we humans made up of these cells, we function like them. We also form ourselves into groups, whether these are families, companies, or nations. Like an individual cell, a differentiated person can stay connected to others without losing his or her identity or without taking on the emotional anxiety of the group. A differentiated leader can take a well-defined stand even when followers disagree while remaining connected in a meaningful way with others. Now, here's the deal. Some people in these organizations are poorly differentiated and they act like viruses. Viruses do not have a nucleus or a core organizing principle, so they cannot exist on their own. Rather, they look for other poorly differentiated cells that are easy to latch onto. Now, this may look like harmless workplace gossip, but what they are doing is infecting the organization with their anxiety. They cannot handle one-on-one -on -one conflict with another person, so they attempt to rope in a third person, thinking this will lessen the anxiety. This is what Friedman calls emotional triangles. And if you are the one being roped in or triangled, it's so tempting to enmesh yourself with the drama. It's even flattering. Hey, you are being asked to help out in a situation, so this person must really trust you. But don't do it. Don't get triangled, because this only leads to getting stuck and only results in more anxiety in the system. And the infection spreads. And worse, it's bad for you. Friedman says that the chief cause of stress and burnout is not overworking like we all think, but getting stuck in other people's problems or getting triangled. But the differentiated leader is like the emotional immune system of an organization. By being a non-anxious presence, differentiated leaders resist being triangled, which influences others to take responsibility for themselves. 
This is very counterintuitive to those of us who are used to chronically anxious organizations. But Friedman says that differentiated leaders are able to tolerate other people's discomfort because this encourages them to take personal responsibility. In the long run, the differentiated leader's presence has the effect of diffusing the anxiety in the organization, allowing it to develop and function in a healthy way. Now, about sabotage. Some organizational systems are chronically anxious. In other words, they have a lot of people who are poorly differentiated. Such an organization will be threatened by the presence of a differentiated leader because, in a way, this upsets the way things have always been, or the homeostasis of the organization. So, the chronically anxious organization will inevitably turn on the differentiated leader. But, according to Friedman, Sabotage is a sign that the leader is doing the right thing, and it's the leader's non-anxious response to such sabotage that defines the differentiated leader. This, he says, is the key to the kingdom of effective leadership. The beauty of this approach to leadership is that it applies to anyone at any leadership level, whether you are, as Friedman says, a parent or a president. Finally, differentiated leadership is not a static condition. None of us arrives completely at this place. Rather, differentiated leadership is a direction in life, a direction toward maturity. And the only way we can get moving in that direction is to take care of ourself. Or, as Jesus of Nazareth said, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay. My uh my back, am I not back? I have no idea. Are We're back to the Brady family. All right. Um okay, let me uh let me go back to the um the slideshow. Do, do you do you have any questions, Dwayne? The attachment that theory might, argues whoa, that hey a now. strong hey, emotional hey, 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 and hey, physical bond to one primary Nobody listen to that guy. First year. <laughs> okay. That was dangerous. <laughs> that may have been a lie. We'll never know. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So back to our our uh, slides here. But do you have any questions, uh, Dwayne, that might help shape things based on what we've seen so far? No. I'll, I'll let you keep on going. Keep going. All right. Here we go. Okay. So just to uh, kind of take some more of Friedman's thoughts, I appreciate the way that the that that video captures at least the relational dynamics of, of anxious and non-anxious leadership. He calls it leadership, and this is in the context of A Failure of Nerve, which is a book on leadership, but I find it incredibly helpful and applicable across relational uh, lines in all kinds of different places. But just to kind of help us lay it out a little bit further, just five characteristics of anxiety within any kind of relational system. Again, marriage, your uh, your uh, 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 workplace, uh, the, the neighbor, you and your neighbor's relationship, all those kinds of things. I, I bumped ahead there, but uh, let me start with the first one, heightened levels of reactivity, just to kind of give you some ideas on this. That's that automatic, instinctive uh, bypassing of the thinking part of your brain uh, that, that, and keeping the emotional atmosphere is highly, at a highly charged level. So here's some thoughts on that, some, okay, some pictures of that. It's quickness to interrupt each other, to think for each other, to complete one another's sentences. Not sandwiches, but I know some of you were thinking I was gonna say that. Uh, quick to take things personally or to make things personal. Confusion of feelings with opinions. Uh, to seldom, seldom, seldom marked by objective, dispassionate discussion of issues. And it's less place, playfulness and humor. Everything is dire. The word serious comes up a lot in that context. And then Friedman really presses that point. The absence of playfulness is a really big sign in a relationship of anxiety. Okay, the second is hurting instinct, or yeah, the hurting instinct. Uh, th this is where we're pressuring one another to uniformity or sameness. It's, 
discouraging of a dissent. It's feeling, feelings becoming more important than ideas. It's peace is always chosen over progress, comfort over experimentation or security over adventure. Um, we see that, uh, that hurting instinct in, in an unwillingness to allow uh, people to share alternate ideas. There's no space for nuance, and that might come up again a little bit later. The next is blame displacement. This is victimization over uh, versus responsibility. Um, you heard that a little bit in the video. This is what's happening in Genesis 3, for example. You got Adam blaming Eve, Eve blaming the servant, serpent, the serpent blaming uh, nobody because he knows he's the only one that seems to be willing to admit his part in the drama. And maybe partly, if he stays quiet, he'll make Adam and Eve and every the rest of us continue to think that uh, that the best option is to continue to blame displace. Um, if they if he if he owns his stuff, then maybe they'll go to healthy repentance. But of course they don't. This includes lots of finger pointing, people seeing themselves as victims, saying things like within our marriages, and this is not an uncommon one even in my marriage. Uh, well, I wouldn't have responded that way if you hadn't, and then you fill in the blank. Constantly diagnosing others. Um, this is that. Uh, shield versus sword idea in personality tests. Um, I'm a friend and, and a, 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 a fan of the Enneagram, but, but any kind of personality test very easily could become something that we'll uh, find ourselves saying, oh, well, of course you'd think that. You're a seven, you're a four, you're a nine, you're an ISTJ, uh, whatever personality uh, thing, where we use them as swords, where we can attack and belittle and diminish each other, or we use it as a shield where we'll always say, well, it's not my fault because I'm a nine and nines aren't, shouldn't look like that and shouldn't be able to respond that way. And why are you making me respond that way? Don't judge me. So blame displacement. Uh, the fourth uh, uh, characteristic of an anxious system is a quick fix mentality. That's, you see that in the title of Friedman's book. It's looking for immediate, painless or as limited pain as possible ways to fix the problem. It's where you're expecting others to solve the problem and now. It's low thresholds of pain, so solutions must be as painless as possible. Um, that's the, uh, I might as well just keep taking pain pills rather than going and getting the surgery, kind of an idea. It's excessive use of compromise, or my wife's pointing at me because I have a tennis elbow problem and I gotta go back to my doctor and I'm afraid to, so I keep taking Advil. Um, Low threshold of pain, so solutions must be as painless as possible. Excessive use of compromise or manipulation to get your solution to be the right one. That happened to me just the other day in, a, in, in the middle of a, a, a small committee meeting in, um, in our community where I realized that, uh, that uh, we were at a little bit of a crossroads and different opinions on how to deal with, a, with an issue. And one of the responses was to yell at, at, at the group, and especially at me, because my opinion wasn't theirs, and to effectively say, if we don't do it my way, we quit. Um, you see that kind of manipulation happening. Uh, symptom, uh, symptom elimination is the key instead of eliminating the underlying problems. And then uh, there's the love of the self-help aisle at the bookstore, and three easy steps approach. that We see that all the time in, in anxious systems. Uh, but finally, the lack of well-differentiated leadership. You heard that uh, video share that idea, this, this notion that uh, when, we, when we don't have a clearly defined sense of self, what I prefer to use the language of identity, we don't know who we are, we're very likely to find who we are in the people around us, in the, in the interpretations or the assumptions of the people that, that, uh, that we seem to put the most stock in, their, their opinion. And so a well differentiated leadership, uh, it, uh, a lack of that is, a, is a, an evidence of, of that kind of system. So this is uh, what we think relationships will look like, where we're floating on a nice calm water and we all have our spot and everybody's relaxed, but really it looks more like this. Um, you can kind of see there's this uh, little guy that is about to destroy their world. Because if he climbs out of the thing, you see that rock down there. Uh, there's the mom, completely oblivious, or secretly thinking they're taking a picture so I have to smile, but I really want to throttle my son. But we know one of these kids is going to topple these, these inner tubes. When I was a kid, that's what we used to do. We would, we would try to pile as many of us onto a giant, one of those giant inner tubes as we could. 
and we'd all try to sit on it at the same time and get the perfect balance so that it would hold. And uh, I'm just now laughing at myself because I realize I'm using my hands a lot and none of you can see me. But, uh, <laughs> but there's, this, uh, there's this desire to, to make sure that the inner tube stays upright. But there's always that one kid. There's always that one person that that's, uh, never plays by the rules. They don't want to keep the, the inner tube steady. And so they're constantly jumping off of it. And within relationships, within anxious systems, there's always that person that's willing to push against the grain just a little bit or to demand that whatever their interpretation of is of fun or of the right way to go or anything like that, they'll establish some sort of, a, um, uh, they'll, they'll make some sort of a, an action that will cause everyone else on the inner tube to have to shift to accommodate their anxiety. That's what we're talking about when we talk about anxious systems. Um, I couldn't find a video or even a picture of a whole bunch of people on an inner tube, but I did find this one. And, and it kind of captures it, not really, but it's still hilarious to me. Um, and I really love the little guy's, uh, uh, what is that thing called? A uh, mullet. Um, it's pretty outstanding, but usually eventually somebody gets tired of the way that things are and they'll make sure that the other person gets clobbered and the slow motion is the best part. I'm sorry, again, this may not approve anything, but I thought <laughs> if I am gonna get a laugh out of this video, you might as well. Is that an old family video? <laughs> no, I never had a mullet, uh, but I did use that hair though, I promise. Um, <laughs> the alternative, uh, or some other ways that this gets described, you can, here's another great book that's out there. This one's actually written from a Christian perspective, and it touches on freedom a little bit. Just um, the leader's journey, and uh, and they they rec recognize these basic uh, ideas within an anxious system. Understand that conflict, this first one, doesn't mean any conflict, but it's the it's the presence of conflict that never seems to diminish. Conflict in and of itself is, can be a somewhat healthy thing. It provides space for us to love each other and to learn from each other, to to be exposed to the needs of others outside of ourselves. But it's when that's all it is. Distancing, and I'm going to be bringing up a, a grid here in a few moments. Uh, that I, that I use in counseling and I use in, in just in private conversations and I use it in my own head when I'm thinking through my relationships. But distancing is this idea that when the tensions, the anxiety really rises in a relationship, we find ourselves pulling away from other people. That's the language that you can hear it in, in the Friedman's idea of non-anxious presence. It's the opposite of that. It's absence. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Then there's this idea of over-functioning and under-functioning. It's those people in the relationship that when things are not going the way the system demands, you'll have people that will over-function to try to keep the, keep the system running the way they think needs to be. And then other people will intentionally or uh, subconsciously even begin to back away. They'll become under-functioning. So this reciprocal relationship that ends up happening. Um, here's a, here's a little illustration that, that was in, that's in, uh, the leader's journey. Uh, one evening, uh, let me back up. Anne and her husband, Daryl frequently clash over his driving. He's no regard for either the speed limit or the fear and anxiety that speeding creates in her. 10 years earlier, her sister was killed in an automobile accident. Anne's complaining has not produced a change in Daryl's driving habits. One evening, Anne and Daryl are taking visit are, are taking visiting to visiting family members out to dinner across town. They're in two vehicles with Daryl driving the lead car and Anne following. True to form, he's driving fast and furiously and Anne is doing her best to keep up with him. Her anxiety is rising by the second. Then it dawns on her. She has a part to play in this silly chase scene. She has her own gas and brake pedals. She can control them. She's responsible only for her vehicle and those who are with her. She slows down to the speed limit. When she does, her anxiety begins to subside. More than that, she's able to see in this episode of her life a kind of metaphor for how she's played the part of an over-functioner in many of the chase scenes in her life with Daryl and others trying her best to control their behavior rather than changing her own. Um, again, we'll talk more about some of that later, and I hope that this is starting to generate some questions, so I hope you folks are writing them down. And the last one, of course, is projecting onto others, um, always, uh, always uh, assuming the, uh, what other people are thinking, what other people are saying, and you see a little bit of that in Friedman's uh, ideas as well, namely that, uh, that we tend to uh, 
bl place blame. We tend to assume. We tend to uh, create uh, uh, notions of what we think everyone else ought to do and ought to be and how they're acting must mean about us and what it must mean about their, their opinions. And anyway, we create all kinds of messes with that. I think uh, that'll be the last thing I say on that. But Dwayne, do you have any, any clarifying thoughts that you want, want to address before I show the grid really quickly? And hopefully after we're done with that, we'll be able to get some practical Let's just, yeah, I'll just hold off and, and let you keep your train of thought. All right. Um, well, okay, so here's the grid. I, I don't know, uh, I was, when I read the, that little one page article, it talked about the idea of Friedman's idea of non-anxious presence. And in the course of his conversation, this person said, well, if there is a non-anxious presence, then it's, then it logically makes sense that there are some alternatives. There's, there's a non-anxious absence. There's an anxious presence. There's a an anxious absence. Well, um, I uh, started naming these some time ago, like I say, maybe 10 years ago, I started naming these with uh, just a kind of, a, because I'm a visual learner, it helps me out. Um, the first idea that we, I thought would be worth talking about is this idea of anxious absence, what I call ostrich mode. Ostrich mode is that, uh, is that space we go into when there is relational anxiety in our, our way of engaging it is to remove ourselves from those relationships. You see this in family uh, situations when, where uh, a, a, a brother will refuse to go to any more family reunions because that jerk is there. Um, there, there will be times where they'll, there'll be opportunities to send a text to somebody, but they'll opt, somebody will opt not to send that text because if I send the text, it might stir up the fight again and I don't want to do that and I'd rather I'm just it's the idea of sticking your head in the sand and hoping that if I just avoid the, the relationship everything will get better. Friedman argues over and over in his book that is the absolute last thing that you want to do to, to stick your head in the sand and hope it goes away will only stir the system up worse. Um, that's the anxious absence or ostrich mode. The next option is the savior mode or quick fix mode. This is where we think we need to be the one that makes it right. We need to enter into the into uh, into this thing and, and, and try to use these aspirin or Advil level responses or sometimes really just verbal violence, manipulation, all kinds of other things um, to, to try to turn the tide of where we think to the way we think things Ought to be. You see this in our political cycle. You see, uh, one generation of voters come up and they and they move the they move the political ship one direction, and then another group comes up and says, "Hey, no, we're not being heard." And then they come in and they start vilifying the other, and then they take over, and it goes back and forth. You see it. It's it's pretty it's pretty ruthless, and it and it happens. It happens in our engagements all the time. You have that person that that will. Uh, it always seems to want to pick the fight or they'll always want to be the one who shares with you. And as the pastor, there's always that one person, you know, there are a couple of people that'll come to you and say, well, you know, people are really upset about something. And I want you to know that uh, while I understand what you're doing, they're really concerned. It's that triangling idea that uh, the video talked about. This is all ways that we go into savior mode. We try to fix what's broken, but we try to fix it without reference to healthy, loving dynamics. And of course, that's gonna be, a, that's a really loaded phrase. And I, and I, whoops, I recognize that, uh, um, oh, okay, yeah. And I recognize that that can be problematic. But uh, Tertullian, way back in the 300s, used, uh, 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 seemed to be stumbling on this idea when he said, now, nothing undertaken through impatience can be transacted without violence. Everything, everything done with violence has either met with no success or has collapsed or has plunged to its own destruction. We see that in relationships all the time. Uh, impatient, uh, verbal violent, or even sometimes physical violent uh, attempts to save and secure our own sense of comfort within when our anxiety raises its ugly head. The next, the next option is the non-anxious absence and that's uh i call that the hermit mode um this is uh this is the husband that comes home at the end of a very busy day 
anxiously, and I, I noticed the last couple of days I've been doing this, not coming home with a beer and uh, barbecue chips in my hand, but coming home and saying, I think I need to go lay down for 10 minutes. Uh, but the non-anxious absence person doesn't come home and lay down for 10 minutes. They just emotionally have checked out. You see that in marriages all the time. Relationally disconnected, relationally um, uh, no longer caring. There's an apathy that's that's entered into the marriage. There's an apathy that enters into uh, your church life or your business life. Uh, a friend of mine has a has a dysfunctional work environment, and he complained about that to me one day. And and then and he said, and then one day he said, you know what? I think I can be a part of the solution. And he started to engage with some potential solutions, and and they were met with resistance, and met with resistance, and met with resistance. And now he's just given up. He's just said, well, I'm just going to collect my paycheck and die someday. <laughs> um, but then the, the non-anxious absence, while that is a potentially dangerous place, if you stay there, Friedman would argue, um, while he doesn't call it non-anxious absence, he does recommend that there are seasons, there are times when you can, when you ought to step back a bit from the anxious system to make sure that you're seeing it right. You have to have space where you step back. We, we have this crazy thing in our culture called vacation. Uh, something in, within Christianity called Sabbath. Or, or, or sometimes uh, some professionals will take um, sabbaticals. This, these times where you separate from the chaos so you can have a clear perspective. But the purpose of those moments, those non-anxious absent moments where you say, the problems may be there when I get back. <clears throat> They, but the, but they, but I don't need to be in them right in this moment. To have that moment where you're able to step back and say, no, I need a break. I'm going to come back again with a fresher perspective. That's a good thing that ultimately can lead us to the gospel mode. And so this, this is the mode that I want to talk kind of about in a little bit greater detail as we go forward. But I call it gospel mode. I just, it's that idea of, of, Understanding who we are in Christ, understanding our, our uh, the love that he has for us, this, the, 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 the place we have in his heart, the fact that we are never going to be taken out of his hand, to look at a situation in front of us and say, he's given us for such time as this, I've been put into this world and, and it's very possible that I might have something to say into this anxious system, but not in a quick fix way, but in a healthy secure, well-differentiated sense of self that I'm able to step toward people. This, here's another Tertullian quote that I think really captures this. He would say that that's a combination of patience in particular, but it's a combination of relaxation and urgency. Urgent, it, it's the acknowledgement that there is something broken. And God in his grace gives us opportunity to speak into that brokenness. He calls us to speak into that brokenness. He calls us to engage it in, in, in healthy, godly ways, but from a position of peace, of relaxation, Tertullian calls it. Uh, and so we're able to enter in. I, by the way, I, I, didn't, I, I never could find a good image there. So if any of you have a better image for gospel mode, I'll take it. I just needed a picture with two people in it where things were pretty calm. Dustin Webb's uh, background on his video tonight is a pretty good picture of that. I don't know if uh, hey, Dave. it's back with him yet, but yeah question yes uh so as you're talking that i mean the image that comes to my mind is jesus in the boat and it's not a peaceful scene it's, yeah. it's a storm and of course highly anxious moment um and they're trying to sabotage him i mean you talked about some of these words like infection sabotage differentiated leader um and obviously he seems to be quite indifferent uh to the needs of the the people in the boat and uh, i think sometimes especially in kind of a in our christian communities where many of us are kind of living off the uh unsaid idea that righteousness is somehow tied to what i do and so the anxiety and the energy that motivates us to do a lot of things for god that seems good on the surface is kind of driven out of that insecurity and that anxiety yes. of, is god pleased with me am i doing okay uh, maybe if I just keep doing this work, God will look past me and everything will be okay. Um, and then you have a storm, like a pandemic, or you have a literal storm, like the disciples in the boat. And Jesus seems to be indifferent to it all. 
but he's present in the boat, <laughs> right? He's present. Um, so, and I know you're going this direction towards the gospel, but in your mind, when you study that passage, what is, what is Jesus exposing in that fearful, anxious moment? What does he really want them to see about it? Um, because I feel like we all are sensing that right now in our own spirit. We know God's in our boat. He's in our home. He's in our church. Uh, but we're dealing with this anxiety that's growing. Right. Um, and he seems to be indifferent in some ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it it's kind of a, an aloof question, but how would you address it? Well, I mean... The first thing is that what ends up happening is what, what we're seeing with the disciples in the boat, what we see in our own lives is that what's really being threatened is our own sense of control and, and other idols that kind of play with that control idea. And, uh, and so you've got Jesus showing them that they don't have control. And the person who has a, who's a non-anxious presence doesn't have control either. They do, other than they have a sense of knowing that the one who has control has them in his arms. They can walk toward it. But, but then they, but they're going to be along the way cataloging and addressing their own idolatrous fears to, 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 to the Ed Welch kind of idea of people being big and God being small. And, uh, and, uh, and instead of flipping the script on that, um, the disciples are looking at the storm and it is big. They're looking at their own inability in this, and they're feeling overwhelmed. Jesus, don't you care? I mean, that, that, that question that they ask him is the epitome of anxiousness. And here's Jesus, able to sleep in the midst of the storm. I think that's a beautiful picture. He's not, because he's not threatened. His idols aren't threatened because he didn't have idols. He has his eyes on the Father where our eyes ought to go. And so, I mean, you may be going another direction. I'm happy. Uh, I mean, our fears motivate us, right? So you've been saying that in, their, in the quadrant, you know, the fear motivates us to behave a certain way. And so at the same time, the fear is exposing an underlying message right. about our hearts. And yes, it, it's going to expose some things. And there's good... Let's pull this back up and see if it takes us there. It takes us to that basic idea. Um, okay. Um, okay. Back here. Well, quote. Um, One reason for anxiety is obvious. If I imagine the worst, I will be prepared for it. Worry is looking for control. It's still irrational because worry will not prepare us for anything, but at least it has its reasons. Going one step further to track this message back to its origins, Welch says there's an entire worldview implicit in some worry. It cries out about an ultimate aloneness. There's no one who can really help, no one can rescue, no one who is really looking out for you. You're an orphan in a chaotic universe that operates according to chance. And he says, who wouldn't be worried given such a view of reality? When a person constantly practices and reinforces his or her own worry that motive, motives may be darker. Human beings are naturally self-oriented. Some people are unusually altruistic, but we can easily find a selfish bent to our lives. If that's true, it's likely that even our worry reflects some self-centeredness. Worry puts the focus on me. Worry lets me indulge in self-pity. When I worry, people listen. And you hear that so loudly right now with this with the coronavirus. You're hearing people um, expressing their worry in ways that, uh, that, will, that, that, that show a profound lack of an understanding that they're not alone in this universe, that our God is in control, that he is doing things that, 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 that uh, are for our good, even as he's very much, we're, we're right in the middle of a true threat. I mean, there's fear and anxiety mixed together in this. Um, but that's what exposes, and I started to hint at this a moment ago, this idea of fear and idolatry. One of the signs that an object is functioning, Keller, Tim Keller says, as an idol is that fear becomes one of the chief characteristics of life. When we center our lives on the idol, we become dependent on it. If our counterfeit God is threatened in any way, our response is complete panic. We do not say, what a shame, how difficult, but rather this is the end. There is no hope. 
I think that's in his book, Counterfeit Gods. Um, and so what do we do? How do we walk this out? And I'll, I'll give these ideas and there's a couple, couple more thoughts here and then I'm gonna open it up to lots and lots of questions, hopefully. Okay, so calming down and believing up. This is how I think we get to that gospel mode, right? Um, we, start to, we start to address it through um, a handful of assessment paths. The first one is self-awareness. Just kind of getting to that point where I'm like, okay, I just snapped at my wife. Why did I snap at my wife? I snapped at my wife because something <coughs> in my heart was being threatened. <coughs> and my response was to snap. Or my response was to pull back. Where am I on the grid in that moment? Um, and w walking that out and clarifying, am I, and by the way, I wanted to say this, uh, you're not going to always be not at, you're not constantly an, an anxious absence or an anxious presence or a, a non-anxious <laughs> with every relationship, depending on the relationship, you could be all over the map. Some relationships you are going to be very much, uh, especially in relationships where you are, uh, you have a superior you could find yourself in, in, or in a place where, you, where the threat seems more real. You might pull away rather than come in for the fight. Depending on your personality, you might be willing to, to uh, address it. Twos, for example, and sixes are notoriously willing to triangle. Man, I'll tell you what. I, and, and, and when I go to unhealthy places in my own personality, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm using twos and sixes. That's an Enneagram language for those of you who don't know. Uh, forgive me for that. But um, but the idea is that you've got these different ways that God has wired us that will make us prone to certain ways of engaging with our idols. But certain relationships will pull us into different quadrants. Um, but self-awareness is a key part of that conversation. And then there's lie assessment. This is the identity question. Who am I really? And what is this moment and my anxiety trying to say I am? What is, who is it saying I am that's causing me to want to start to drift toward trying to get someone else or this dynamic, this relational mess to, to, to calm down or for people to think of me differently? Why am I allowing it to control uh, my sense of who I am? Like a young woman who, uh, who's trying to figure out, does she want to break up with her boyfriend? Does she not want to break up with her boyfriend because of because of some painful things that are going on in the relationship and her fear in that conversation is what will his friends think of me? Maybe they'll just think I'm, I'm over, uh, over emotional or, uh, what will my parents think? Because they'd rather I did, or they rather I didn't break up with this guy. And, and what will they say? And then all of a sudden they've lost their differentiation. And so, they, 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 they've lost their sense of identity in Christ as they don't reflect back on who, who does he say I am? Who does the Father say I am in light of Christ? And, 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 and I appreciated Dwayne earlier when you brought up the idea that we do this even in our relationship with God. And I, I should have mentioned that. That's fantastic and absolutely true. That one of, the, one of the most obvious places that we go to anxiousness is in our understanding of what the gospel says about my about my security in the justifying work of God in the person and work of Jesus and his righteousness for me. Anyway, so we have to walk that out and then address the lies of our heart that are trying to undermine or deny that truth. And then of course, to you know, kind of go back to that Keller quote, I am a dealing, I am dealing with idolatry. Um, what, what is this thing that I'm trying to establish? Somebody's my opinion of me or my, uh, uh, my looking right in front of the right kind of people, what idol is there? And then when that idol expo or kind of raises its head, what is it I'm thinking that thing has that my heavenly father is less than? Um, he's, he, he's greater than any of my idols, but to, I've got to address the idols and then I've got to go to the who is he. Um, and then now I'm ready to start doing those gospel applications. How do I move on the grid? I'm recognizing the idols. I'm recognizing the lies. I'm recognizing where I am on the grid. Now I'm starting to preach the gospel to my heart. Now I'm starting to uh, preach against the lies. I'm starting to preach against those idols of my heart. Um, and, then, uh, and then, of course, along the way, 
uh, and I put this one last for a reason, we do need to kind of deal with, because relationships are never just about us, they're about all the people around us, I am asking the question, where is that other person perhaps on the grid? Um, I don't start there, because if I start there, I don't do any of the self-work that I'm supposed to do, that Friedman would say I'm supposed to do, that I would contend even more importantly, the Bible says I'm supposed to do, as it says, as Jesus himself says, take the log out of your own eye before you worry about the speck in your brother's eye. Nonetheless, as I'm dealing with that log work, and I'm dealing with the log jam there, I still have to have a moment where I say, now, why are they reacting the way they are? Perhaps there's a, an idol that they're dealing with, and maybe I can help them think through that. This is why Friedman was so committed to, he said one, along the way when he used to do counseling and he would do uh, in, engaging with organizations and trying to help them figure out their dysfunction, he would, early on, his temptation was to go to the most dysfunctional person and try to fix them. And he realized that the better way was to go to the, the person who was, seemed most willing and ready to change and help them walk back toward health. Well, once we're kind of, it's, it's that idea of uh, when you've got a drowning person, make sure that you're secure before you try to help the drowning person because you don't want two drowning people. It's the same image that you have in an airplane. Uh, when you've got the oxygen mask falling on, you don't put it on the kid first. You put it on yourself first. Make sure your lungs are full and then you put it on the kid. You make sure that you're taken care of so that you can be a ready and able presence and, 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 a, and a help for the people around you. So others' awareness, though, does come, but only after you've done self-awareness. Okay, that's kind of where we are. We're in the um, uh, questions and application point of, of our conversation. And uh, I am hoping you can. Yeah, you know, thank you, David. <laughs> At the start, we had about three doctors in the medical profession out there. Um, and so I'd, I'd be curious to hear from them. Um, so when you, when you start to notice that anxiety is starting to wear on you week after week, especially during the quarantine periods, um, what, are some, what are some physical symptoms to indicate that anxiety is um, starting to have an impact on my life. <clears throat> I mean, what are some of the telltale signs that this is not mild anxiety, or maybe it is just mild anxiety, but this is becoming strong anxiety. Um, just open up to the group. Um, how are we doing? <laughs> so I have just FYI, everyone is muted. And so if you have something you wanna share, just go ahead and raise your hand. You want to explain what that means for the folks that may have come in late? Yeah, so if you will scroll over the word participant, you should be able to have an option there to raise your hand. Or if you just want to like click on your, I think, I think you can do it through a couple different ways, but the participant way is the easiest. Um, and I can, put it all back in gallery view here and I can see if there are raised hands or you can put something in the chat bar and I can click on you and see that you need to be unmuted. So is there it, one of the doctors would like to chime in about any of this? While they're doing that, I noticed that Peter and Laura mentioned the Friedman book. Yes. It, I am totally stealing from Friedman. Good catch. She has to unmute you herself, so yeah. you have to raise your hand. Oh, there you go. I can hear someone. Who is that? Is that the raise? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I, we are unmuted. Yep, you're unmuted. What was, the, what was the question again? Just the physical manifestations of it? Yeah, what are some of the, the signs? Um, I mean, there are mild signs, there are strong, severe signs that have to do with anxiety. What are some of those things that we could kind of be aware of? Um, well, I, you know, I do think a, a lot of them are psychological, um, um, not, not physical, although with more severe anxiety, uh, certainly there'd be physical manifestations as well. But I think, um, you know, that psychologically, and, and I'm actually 
some, somewhat applying this to you know <clears throat> my own experience of anxiety is I think uh, it's a lack of focus. Um, you know, you you um, kind of uh, an acquired attention deficit issue. You're you're looking for something to to redirect your thoughts. Um, you're you're looking for a way to redirect your thoughts to something that um, is less anxiety provoking, perhaps. But certainly, when people are um, manifesting physical manifestations of anxiety, you're going to see uh, restlessness. You're going to see um, fast heart rate, perhaps uh, maybe sweating or perspiring. Um, and you know, then there's the interesting um, manifestation of anxiety, kind of a panic attack sort of thing, which is an interesting hybrid of anxiety and and a, a physiologic predisposition where you have just a, a burst of overwhelming anxiety. Uh, those are those are interesting, though, because those could be provoked by even really small things, and then people will have a you know just a, a, a usually just a few minutes of overwhelming anxiety. So I, I guess those are the, my thoughts on on the matter. I think you know that that idea in uh, I. I was just thinking how Dave uh, was challenging me to be warmly present, even uh, uh, while he was still at uh, Christ Church. Uh, the ideas of Friedman were already uh, mm -hmm. um, informing his uh, his uh, counsel uh, to me. Uh, some of it in jest, but I'm sure some of it in uh, uh, in seriousness. And I've actually remembered that um, that idea of. You know, I think if you're warmly present, you're not anxious. You're you're able to to focus on on someone else and not uh, and not on your your own problems. So you can be you can have a sustained attentiveness to to things uh, when you're not anxious. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's another question, Dave. Mm -hmm. I'm going to switch over to um, Fred. Yeah, I see that question there. Yeah, so hold on one second. Let me figure out how to unmute him. There you go, Fred. Hopefully, oh, maybe you, you might have to unmute yourself, Fred. Just, just a question on uh, more practicality uh, how do we get ourselves out of this anxious presence when we start to recognize it and uh, move forward from there? Well, what I do is I call my elder, Fred Winteroff, <laughs> and I have him remind me of the gospel. That's what I do. Um, I mean, I, I, did th I think a lot of it is, uh, you heard Bill even say that, just kind of starting to get your eyes off the thing that's that's either creating that, background hum of anxiety or the or um the more abject fear that's kind of developed because it seems like the objects right in front of us have, uh, that, that's threatening our sense of calm but to this is when i'm preaching the gospel to myself this is when i'm starting to ask those questions of my heart what's triggering this why is this triggering it what what place has this person uh or, or this situation got in my heart that uh, that's replacing the God who is way bigger than this. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, there's a lot of self-talk um, as I'm going back to the word and I'm going back to, or to people who will help me think through this clearly. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but you're, you're very, you're, but practically, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, Okay, you want a practical example? My wife is telling me I need to give a practical example. Um, <laughs> my, Jen and I will, uh, my wife is a brilliant woman. Just start there. Uh, <laughs> but we don't always agree uh, in the moment on her brilliance because I'll think mine trumps hers. Uh, no, usually in the context of our uh, of our kids, raising our kids, we'll have these moments where we don't see eye to eye, and uh, and I'll find myself just one little tiny example is I'll find myself 
saying the words, you're not hearing me. And what I mean is, you're not doing what I want. And it almost becomes like a, uh, uh, my own little attempt to control my universe uh, because I'm feeling this lie in my heart that I'm insignificant, that I, I'm voiceless, and, and I, have to, I have to walk back to what does the Father say about me? There she is, okay. Um, uh, what does the Father say about me? Who does he say I am in light of his son? What, what is he going to say to me when I, get, uh, when I stand with him in glory um, and before him in glory? All of these different questions, I'm asking that, that so that I can come back and go, wow. It's not that you're not hearing me. It's that I fear that for you to not come through for me in the way that I've imagined in my mind it needs to look, it means that all those ideas of, you know, the seven-year-old kid in a house of seven brothers and sisters who felt virtually invisible is right back on display again. But my father sees me and he rejoices over me with singing and he delights in me and he quiets me with his love and all those truths come flooding back again. And I tend to try to control everything. I don't walk around and say, you need to do this and you need to do this. My control is, honey, have you thought about this? Katie, you know, this might be a good idea. What do you think of this? But I'm subtly trying to make everyone around me do the things that I think they need to do. And it's really me being anxious and trying to create the outcomes that I think need to happen instead of trusting God to be who he is and thinking that I have to step up and save everyone. Mm -hmm. Clearly, that's not the case. Clearly, God is in control. I can trust him with my children. He loves them more than I do. I can trust him with my husband. <laughs> so when we're arguing about how to discipline them, I don't have to get my way. Hmm. We have another question. Um, from the Denmarks. Um, I think I've unmuted you, yeah. uh, Denmarks. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Well, Hi. I just, in, in listening to the, uh, the conversation, I was wondering uh, the, the aspect of, that worship would play in dealing with this anxious presence, um, both, and, and, and I specifically talk about both personal worship and your devotions. Uh, family, as well as uh, corporate worship, the role that, um, especially in corporate worship, and, and of course, we, at least I, for so many years, thought that I could only sing, confess, uh, invoke, um, confess my faith, confess sin in a corporate setting, and, and found it very um, helpful personally when I was doing that in my devotion time, and then trying to do that uh, maybe to a lesser degree with success with my family, um, but then always having the corporate context to to be overwhelmed um, with the not only the presence of God but hearing God's word um, and having that impact me, confessing what I believe, uh, praising the Lord, um, and and so I mean, again, I, I just was wondering if you would maybe tease out some thoughts about the, the role of worship in dealing with this. Well, I mean, I think you, you, if you just kind of engage in all the means of grace, the, 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 the word of God and prayer and, and, and the community of faith and, 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 and the sacraments, all of those are, are opportunities for the gospel to be, to be, uh, anchoring and, and the foundation being strengthened for uh, when those other when those lies come and when the idolatries come so no question uh, with regard to corporate that corporate sense which is kind of uh creating a quite a, a discombobulation in my own heart with this with the COVID 19 thing we've got this i i, I we're, we're, we've lost the ability to stay as connected and i think that that has impacted our uh, has, has only elevated our anxiety. Um, so finding ways like many of our churches are trying to do to reestablish connection in the midst of that helps kind of allow us to sing to one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs that, that it's the language of, of uh, um, Col Colossians and Ephesians of, of 
keeping a step with the spirit, letting the word of Christ dwell in us. Like all of that idea of corporateness mm-hmm. is supposed to provide that. I think it's, that's the biblical language going on there, but I'd really love to hear from Dwayne in this. Dwayne, do you have some thoughts on that too? Hello. <clears throat> the language I've been using the last couple of years has to do with abiding mm-hmm. and uh, just resting in Christ um, means that I am present with him. Uh, so the worry always throws me into the future. It has my mind spinning things out into the next moment, the next day. But if I am just present with him um, and his word is in my life, it's in my heart, then it's amazing just how at peace and how restful you can be in the moment. And everything is spinning out of control. Uh, the people around you are triggered. Um, everybody is you know, is trying to sabotage or do things to control. But just the way that Christ inoculates and kind of gives you that peace in the storm is amazing. Um, So those disciplines are key in in maintaining that abiding relationship with him. And then I just love how God made us. Um, God is our model. And we see that in Ephesians chapter five, um, because he is, <clears throat> because he loves us, we are to model that love, that purity, that holiness. And when we imitate God, Paul says, um, you know, so when we do that in the presence of others, we're imitating God. And I think that translates into other people's lives, being non-anxious and being present. For me, sometimes I just have to be aware that there are certain things that trigger me. Um, there are certain things about my makeup, my spirituality, my personality that makes me anxious. And for me and my family, it's, it's seasonal things that make me anxious. It's, it's not places, it's not um, <clears throat> certain people, but it's just certain seasons and times in life that I start to feel anxiety um, that reveal my heart. And I think sometimes just for me knowing what triggers me and what gets me all worked up on the inside and then uh, preparing and knowing those things helps too. Did that help a little bit? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that uh, we're, you know, we are all, um, yeah, I think, I mean, the, the seasons thing is, uh, is uh, Dwayne, is, is very, yeah, I think, I think we can all identify with that. Um, you know, and, and, you know, what, which of the means of grace are the things that we go to um, that, will anchor us um and i guess my thought is is that when it comes to worship and expanding that to being gone beyond just corporate worship right now none of us are having corporate worship, but um you know god is still faithful just like he was in the psalms to an individual like david at different seasons in his life um and and i mean david's profoundly uh affected and and worshipful uh, knows, you know, who is saving him and, and yet, and, you know, attacking the, the emotional uh, turmoil that he's in at the same time. I just feel like at worship, you know, we are able to, uh, again, keep God in his holiness, sovereignty, as big as he really is. And we get smaller in ways we're not going to necessarily anticipate. Uh, no matter what the season is, it just allows us to to do that, and we don't rush to that. We rush toward uh, making sure that there's money in the bank account, or um, that there's peace in my relationship with my wife and family, uh, or that you know people are you know doing well uh, around me. So um, I guess for me, worship right now is is that you know is I don't know what to expect when it happens. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not limited to thinking that God's going to act in a particular way. It's not a formula because it never is when, you know, when he, uh, when we worship. Uh, so, uh, but, but I like the season. I'd like that you're recognizing you know, our responsibility is to recognize these seasons. And um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. We have another question from Peter and Laura Spicala. Yeah, hi. Hey, David, can you talk a little more about absence 
and presence kind of either as a continuum and I'll, I'll let you here's what I have in mind uh, each one of us is kind of limited in our modern world we become so aware of so many needs there's so many opportunities for ministry da 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 da, da. and for possibly the best reasons in Christ we rightly discern you know that isn't a thing for me to get engaged in I care mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, so in a sense, there's absence because I'm actually not exercising leadership to influence the scenario. But yet it's very gospel because we're letting God be God and, you know, really seeking his face and Lord, what should I be involved in? Da, da, da. So just muse on that a little or help clarify a little more on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of uh, if we think about that savior mode language, I think a lot of times if we if it's not our role and we try to step into it, we're really practicing anxious presence. We might be thinking that we're practicing a non-anxious presence because we're coming in and pooling collective, but sometimes that's just the arrogant presumption that it was our battle to begin with. And I, so we, we, yeah, you do need to know when it's your space to lead and when it's not your space to lead. Um, I think that uh, it is wise at the time, some of our, the most important, as Friedman would say that, the, the non-anxious presence person is is entering in where they know that they have responsibility to do so and to understand that they at, at to, to some degree have have to take responsibility for the fact that they failed to do something along the way that created some of the mess that they're in and so to step toward in the right places so i i'd affirm that that they're, you're, this isn't a call to step into every situation, but to step into the ones that you're, you are responsible for, that you're called to lead in. We're not all called to lead in every, um, in every scenario with every anxious thing we, that, 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 that's around there. It's certainly different depending on, so is this my relational sphere that needs to be addressed? Do I have a, do I have a, uh, did I have a role to play in making the mess in the first place? What do I need to own? This is part of a non-anxious presence is learning to own. And this is what I like about the idea of corporate worship and private worship within the context of repentance and confession of sin. It's this language of knowing that I have the responsibility, taking the log out of my own eye and all those other things. But nonetheless, you're right. Absolutely. There, presence within the right relational spheres leading when you're supposed to. There's probably Thank you. More. If you if you got me, great. Well, Thank you. I'll certainly receive it. But. Um, I don't know if Anne would like to say anything, but she's put a couple different. Anne Alexander has put a couple different um, little little remarks up in in the chat, and I would I just want to kind of pass it over to Anne. Do you have anything you want to share with us, buddy? Yeah. Um. I'm. I absolutely love this. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> this is really, really well, well summarized, very thought provoking and something I want to go back and see. But I think often my practice in order to keep from being anxious, because I cross cultures all the time and I know it, is that I need to put truthful music into my brain and into my heart continually. And I'm so grateful for Christ Church's focus on vertical worship that's based on truth. And I'm assuming your church is as well. And I just think that there's a lot of good stuff out there that can build our inner non-anxiety by pointing us to God's sovereignty. I also think that, um, you know, Jesus answered a question with a question. And he stood there and listened to people interact with that, you know. He didn't, he didn't require that they come to a conclusion in his presence. He sent them home with a time bomb. Mm -hmm. And they had to interpret it and interact with it and apply it if necessary. And I saw my dad's life impact people very profoundly because that was exactly the way he interacted. And I was just telling mom, last night I, I was able to be on a... a, a very similar to this kind of uh, uh, Zoom conference. And five or, five or more of the people were actually in China and it was all in Chinese. But my dad, when he was in Taiwan as a missionary, would 
chair a committee and then ask somebody else to be in charge of the meetings. And so he'd just sort of sit back and let people interact, you know, and, and if he needed to, to calm down things that was going on between, he could do that very easily just by listening and asking questions. But I think that often we imagine ourselves to be much more in control. We perhaps desire ourselves to be much more in control. But I have a hard time being continually in the presence of people who are very anxious and controlling about things because because then that starts to catch, you know, so I, I kind of have to, I kind of have to ration the time that I spend in that kind of person's presence. Well, that's, that's where, when I was saying there's, a, there's moments where a non-anxious absence is required, just to pull back, make sure that you're, and sometimes the answer isn't to go back toward the anxious person, so, but it is to go into the anxious system and in and, and the, the relational, and sometimes that's the person. If it's your spouse, for example, you, you gotta go. You gotta have those conversations, but maybe stepping back and getting some a breath. But when you mention that, uh, the idea that Jesus goes in with questions, I think that's a, a great, it totally reminded me, and I, I had a quote here from Friedman. He said, the colossal misunderstanding of our time is the assumption that insight will work with people who are unmotivated to change. Communication does not depend on syntax or eloquence or rhetoric or articulation, but on the emotional context in which the message is being heard. People can only hear you when they are moving towards you, and they're not likely to when your words are pursuing them. Even the choicest words lose their power when they're used to overpower. Attitudes are the real figures of speech. Um, I think Jesus practiced that, you know, with a, with a question, he, he wasn't, he was often not, especially with those who were anxiously trying to maintain control, he was not interested in having these battles with them. He would ask them the questions that would reveal, reveal the real intent of their hearts uh, very often. And sometimes he just called them brood vipers, but, uh, but I, you know, there, were, there was a right place for it and there was a wrong place for it. And we know Jesus would always do the right place, but he, he modeled it beautifully. Um, but that's a, that's, a, that's a beautiful picture of your dad. In that regard. By the way, those of you who don't know, I, Ann and I have just started to get to know each other a little bit very recently. Um, Lord willing, if the, if it's allowed, this conference is going to be coming up. So, Fred, you're you're going to get to to get to know Ann a little bit more um, because uh, Ann's going to join us for the uh, the worship conference in September, August, whenever that is. End of August, beginning of September. So, anyway, it's good to see your face. <laughs> good to see your face too. Yeah, you is, Dustin, is Dustin still out there? I think if Dustin is still there, I see his palm tree blowing. I think <laughs> Dustin uh, took a swim there. That that's him out in the ocean. <laughs> okay. I think Dustin would say that exercise is probably one of the most underused anti-anxiety remedies out there. And I was hoping he could speak to that, but he's not. Oh. Is Jen there? I see Jen. He, um, Dustin's here. I just can't unmute him. I'm still. Oh, he probably had himself muted. There he is. He's unmuted. Hey, him. all right. Sorry. I uh, ran, stepped outside, and the family was yelling at me. Can you hear me okay? So, Dustin, with this whole topic of anxiety, that we'd all agree that exercise is probably one of the most underused anti anxiety means available to us so what would you say regarding exercise and anxiety well it's it's definitely a piece that i've been uh, utilizing a lot in fact this week and within within my own community and then i'm in a larger uh fitness community uh, across the country in fact the world um, basic fitness or uh, exercise will help tremendously it releases endorphins and uh, it, it makes you feel better uh, after the fact. Usually when you're doing it, you don't want to do it. So there's a mental aspect of it. <laughs> I see some people chuckling, uh, chuckling but uh, what I've really hit home here re recently with the beginning of all my classes and Zoom sessions uh, to help uh, combat some of this, and it's something that we should be doing uh, and can be doing even before all of this uh, social distancing, and that is uh, be intentional about some breathing exercises before we even get into uh, exercising. 
And so I lead all my classes with uh, what I, what, what's called box breathing. It's something I learned through some Navy SEAL training that I did. And it's just simply about breathing in, holding that breath for a certain period of time, exhaling, and holding the empty lungs for a certain period of time, and then doing that for a cycle of, uh, you know, a number of minutes. And we do that before I go uh, and do any of the exercises. So it helps to uh, take any existing anxiety or any, uh, really anything going on in their lives and just set the tone and then go into exercise. So we call it uh, the first phase of getting ready or first warm up, if you will. And uh, that helps, uh, I, I found it to, to help tremendously. So that, that would be my two cents, uh, that you need to have a little bit of exercise. Obviously with anything, you can go to extremes, so you can do nothing or you can do too much. And so you need to have a healthy balance uh, within that healthy diet, if you will. Okay, there's a great, there's a great quote. Or, well, go ahead, Dwayne, you take your thought where you wanna go with it. No, I just wanted to thank Dustin. Dustin's a board member for Ithaca and I appreciate it what he brings to the table. I'm just saying good night to Peter and Laura, um, uh, who are gonna be leaving us. But uh, here's a, a quote from Friedman that kind of continues this idea. You had mentioned Dustin, I thought it was funny and really true, uh, that exercise is hard. <laughs> exercise and uh, um, just to kind of, I mean, to make that step because we imagine the pain of it, right? Uh, but that's the way that all relational interaction works. Going toward a non-anxious presence is, can be very painful. Um, similar to the way the exercise is, it requires us to kind of have that kind of sense of mental readiness to step toward it. Uh, anyway, he says, whether we are considering a toothache, a tumor, a relational bind, a technical problem, a crime, or, or the economy, most of individuals and most social systems, irrespective of their culture, gender, or ethnic background, will naturally choose or revert to chronic conditions of bearable pain rather than face the temporary, more intense anguish of acute conditions like exercise, um, like going toward the relational discomfort. That are the, that he says the, those, those acute conditions are the gateway to becoming free. That was the image I had earlier of the, of the knee surgery, for example, versus just popping pain pills and trying to manage the pain. Going toward real help and health requires pain, stepping toward the chaos instead of away from it. I think that's, I think that's the definition of love, frankly. David, talking a little bit, like just building off of what Dustin was talking about, uh, I read a book when I was at Labrie that was talking about worry and anxiety, and they talked about simple graces that the Lord, or something along those lines that the Lord gives us, and they, some of the examples that they gave um, are things that I, I feel like we're doing a lot of now during this time, it's like spending time outside. Exercise was one, spending time outside, getting good sleep, um, uh, eating well, uh, staying hydrated, um, crying, having someone that you can really talk to that's like a mentor or a very dear friend that's a part of your life. And these were, um, they said, you're not necessarily going to see these um, in the Bible as far as like, these are the thou shalt do these things, but they were these simple graces that the Lord is like ingrained in us that are very helpful when you are struggling with anxiety or worry. I don't know what you think about that those kinds of things being also helpful. Yeah, exercise, having connections with friends, using things like Skype or Facebook or Zoom or something, some way to communicate uh, directly with someone else just to kind of help you get perspective again. Those little simple graces. I've really appreciated just for my own sake, feeling, feeling an incredible amount of just clarity to go back to what Dustin said and, and what you hinted at, uh, changing my eating routine and, and exercising regularly just this morning, running a 5k and feeling like I was not excited about it when I got up. It was not something I was looking forward to fully, but I wasn't doing it alone. So it's not just exercising, but I was running social distance wise, six feet or so away from a buddy. And we were running a 5k together just so that and then 
being able to talk and well kind of talk or grunted but there were there were a few intelligible sentences in there but yeah this i like that simple graces or is that what you use simple graces um lots of those little moments that can help us kind of regain our sanity and anxiety wise yeah yeah simple graces we've got another um question from tim Troughton. Kim. Oh, from Kim Troughton. Sorry, my oh, boss. Kim. <laughs> um, yeah, just from my, just my thoughts. Um, just want to add because I think everything is really good and there's no silver bullet for anxiety. So just something to add. I think self-compassion is a really important piece. Um, agreeing with God, God's perspective on us, that he doesn't look at us with um impatience or disgust like man why are you feeling that way but i think he has compassion on us like a frightened child in a thunderstorm i think he welcomes us um, as we run to him and he offers that that grace um i think we're a lot harsher on ourselves but um and this is where even talking to other people and other people listening um without judgment is a way a really great way to way to diffuse anxiety um, because it models God's love to us. Um, but for me, that's also something that's been that's really helpful um, is that experiencing um, that aspect and and also talking to God and and asking Him, God, what is your? How do you see me in this? Um, and over, I think it's something that's been learned over time is trusting that he's not um, angry with me over that, but there's, there's a place for, um, for his um, uh, motherly love and his fatherly love that comes out in our, in our um, anxiety. Cause I think, I think the anxiety, there's legitimacy to it. There's, there's, if you look at your anxiety, there's a piece of it um, that is legitimate like COVID-19, there's a reason to, for fear. Um, and so we can have compassion on that piece of it um, and compassion on ourselves for that. Um, maybe not where we, there's, you know, where we take it to, like we don't have to accommodate all that, but um, just compassion for what's legitimate in our anxiety. So. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. We need to go to, Go to those passages of scripture that speak to the father's gentleness, his motherly care, his fatherly care. And then you see that reflected, and I just recently preached on this in First Thessalonians, in the life of the shepherds of, of the flock. They're supposed to be acting that same way. They can't just look at the people that are anxious and, and frantic and say, oh, just grow up. We're supposed to come to the father with, um, with as children. And so as shepherds in the flock we're supposed to come to our people with the same kind of fatherly and motherly care you see both of those images in first thessalonians chapter two uh, of, of, of the way paul engaged with them there's this there's a gentleness and there's a there's a there's a patience that you come toward people you don't come in swinging you know i mean i'm remembering the um uh, admonish them at the end of first thessalonians admonish the idol, I think it says, and then, but it says uh, something else, a, a lot more gentle language with the weak. It's there's this acknowledgement that we're uh, we're are, we're tender people, and, and, and our anxieties are uh, only become a sin when we don't take them to the Father. Yeah, when they when they start to stir up, and we don't take them to the one who can bring some semblance of sanity to us. Uh, that's when we, we go to sin. Instead, we chase after something else. As soon as it starts to rise up, I find another idol to feed it instead of running to my father. And, and so that's when it moves into sin. So what, you know, when Jesus says, cast your cares, or Peter says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Um, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God. And then his peace is going to come over you. Anyway, so you, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I affirm that, Ken. Um, and that's when the gospel truths start to kind of pile in. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen. Um, we are loved, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, Dwayne? That's probably a good place to land the plane. Um, we normally say this at a live um, Ithaca talk, 
if you want to linger and if you want to talk some more, uh, feel free to do so. But if you need to log off and get, get your jammies on like Peter and Laura, um, now's the time to do that. There is no shame in that. It's almost nine o'clock. It's almost close to my bedtime. Um, but for those of you that want to stay on and just kind of chat some more and raise some questions, we're going to be here. Uh, but thank you, David, and thank you, Crystal, for helping us put this all together. And uh, David, you just close us in prayer. Sure. Father, we're grateful that uh, you speak truth to our inner parts. You deal with those anxious places and you deal with them gently. We're reminded of our Savior who a smoldering wick he would not stuff out, a bent reed he would not break. You are gentle in our weakness and our infirmity. You speak to us in, a, in, in, in lullabies to calm us. You remind us that even when we sleep, you never slumber or sleep. Thank you for giving us truth to combat the lies. Thank you for reminding us of your greatness to combat the alternate idols that we would run to. Father, help us. Help us to pursue the path of love by pursuing non-anxious presence in the lives of the people around us, especially in this incredibly anxious time that we're in. To you be the glory as we walk that out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Do we uh, let folks know that uh, they can certainly uh, message me and, and communicate with me elsewhere or outside of this context. Maybe you can get contact information to them through Ithaca. Sounds yeah. good. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'll see who Thank logs you. off here, and I'm going to hang out with um, Crystal and Dave and just see what happens here. Good night, Joe. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone. Hey, it's good to see you all. <laughs> Tom. Hey, Dave. <laughs>